keep it with us all the time. We always had plenty of coffee, but it was that instant coffee, which I really enjoy even today. But uh, old Jim, I always had plenty of this coffee, and Jim was from uh, West Virginia. He was cold man. And we'd sit around, we got a break, you know, for a little lull in the fight, and what? Old Jim might heat us up a cup of coffee. <laughs> We'd offer anyone coffee that wanted to know, but most of them knew where we was getting all this coffee, you know, off dead paratroopers and out of their boots. This man, some of them, there were just a lot of real young kids in there at that time, 17, 18 year old kids, and it kind of repulsed them, you know. They felt like we were grave robbing or robbing dead, and really, you weren't, you know. I mean, the guy's dead, he's not going to be using that stuff anymore anyway, you know. You know, it was hard to come by, so we the cabbies down there a bit up at old Jim and sat there and he'd blow that coffee and he'd say, Lordy, Lordy, this mighty fine coffee. this, Todd. Uh, do you know much about the history of the of the Dirty Dozen? Not really. Well, I have. You probably wouldn't want to look at it, but the wife has got a whole folder on newspaper articles and magazine articles and that in a folder. Uh, before we get into the actual recording and so forth, uh, you would you like for me to brief you just a little bit sure. on Okay, yeah. now in the first place, the uh, and then you might it might help you to direct questions or yeah. or seek answers that you want to see. Uh, the name of the, the original outfit really was the Filthy Thirteenth, and it was just a bunch of kind of outlaw soldiers. They were they none of them were criminals, arch criminals as portrayed in the picture. None of us were under death sentences or life sentences or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, the uh, movie, of course, depicted it on that order. When they got ready to make the movie, I actually took 19 men in instead of 13 because of the mission that I had to accomplish or that they wanted me to accomplish was, was a little larger than really a squad 13 men could handle. So I took in 19 and uh, so they were uh, two or three outsiders in it that didn't belong to the original unit. But none of these, all of these guys got rubbed out except three of us. Three of us got out of it. And then after the war was over, well, I had all, the company commander had asked me to contact, if I wanted to, all the families of these kids that were killed. And I had. And the greatest part of them were Catholic kids. And uh, Germans and Polacks from up in Massachusetts. And, Pennsylvania and then through the coal mining areas, mining areas and so forth. And I had written every one of their parents, you know, and talked to them personally and even visited in their home. And I had made every one of these boys, you know, go out a blazing hero, a very painless death, you know, instant almost, no suffering and no maiming. And that there was always a Catholic priest right there handy to extreme to minister this extreme unction and everything. Of course, I lied about the whole thing to these families just to make them feel good, you know, and, and ease their grief and pain and suffering. Well, it had become a real personal thing to me, and when the war was over, well, then this bunch out in, in Hollywood wanted to make this show the Dirty Dozen, and they contacted me several times. And uh, uh, there was no way that I felt like that, that I could capitalize on it and this and that, and, and it was a real personal thing to me because the guys and I were real close and then I had established good relations with their family. So that whole thing was a, a lie. The, uh, the guys were a bunch of rough-shod soldiers over there just to fight a war and get it over with. And it was true that we had been in, in every jail and stockade from Rome to Rome and Maine to Spain, but it was always just for being AWOL or punching an officer in the eye or, or uh, stealing a jeep or taking the colonel's whiskey and that sort of thing, you know. And we were just banded together, just kind of got off to the side. 
uh, so the the whole show and the show that was depicted in in uh, the Dirty Dozen was not even similar to the mission that we accomplished. Now this is some of the background, and if you want to direct questions in that area, right, you, you feel free to do so. Okay, now how would you like to start it? Today is March 2nd, 1988, and my name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Jake McNeese in Ponca City, Oklahoma. Let me get your birthday. When were you born? Uh, May the 24th, 1919. And where were you born? Maysville, Oklahoma. Maysville. Wally Post country. Yeah, I've seen Wally Post make a lot of jumps down there in the cotton patches back in the late yeah. 20s. Yeah. Well, tell me about him then, that Wally. Wally, is, Wally is, was a nut. He just was a little country boy that grew up around there. He was kind of a kinky kid and all. Uh, he, his dad farmed out north of Maysville about three miles, and old Wally used to come in every Saturday, you know, with a bugboard wagon and a load of watermelons. His dad grew, grew those Stone Mountain watermelons, and they were terrific. And Wally would sell them there, you know, for a nickel, 15 cents a piece. This was back, of course, in the Depression days. But Wally had a wild hair. He always wanted to be an aviator. And uh, he finally, uh, he got in a little problem there. Uh, of course, back in those days, while all the rural people came in town on Saturday, they called it Tight Shoe Day, and they'd come in and do their main shopping and selling and bartering and trading. And one Saturday morning, a farmer or rancher from up north of Maysville, I don't even recall who it was, he came in and he said he had been hijacked right after just past the river fruit. So there was a tire laying out in the road, and he stopped to pick up this tire. That was back during the days of Model A's. Model T's before the Model A's came along and he said he got out and he said this guy jumped out of the bushes you know with a pillow slip over his head in 45 and robbed him. So they didn't think too much about it. But about 30 minutes later another farmer came in he had the same story the same spot and the same circumstances. And then the third one came in and they same thing that happened to him, same spot, same circumstances, same description <laughs> and all. <laughs> so they got up a little posse there and deputy and this and that. And a few of them run out there, a few of the boys run out there. Here this tire was lying in the road and they jumped out to get the tire and out old Wally jumped, you know, with his hood over his head, his hog leg and, and he was going to rob them. I guess he thought he'd found a bird's nest on the ground that many of them at once, you know. But anyway, they took Wiley in, and, and uh, they sent him up to the big house for a few, for a short period of time. And then he came back out of that and went to work in the oil fields down to Oklahoma City. And he was kind of a nut, and he took a bunch of explosives and stuff that they used out in the field and took them home. He was experimenting with moving around with them, and he let it get away from him. It blew up. And that's how he lost that eye, blew his eye. Well, he was smart enough to to convince them that it had happened that on the job, you know, and that they were negligent and this and that. And he sued them and got quite a bit of money out of them. And he came right up here around Ponca City and bought his first old World War I Jenny airplane. And he learned to fly up here. Jack Baskins and some more boats right here in Ponca City taught him how to fly. And after that time, of course, he would come back down to Maysville and uh, he'd fly the old plane down there. He'd get another guy to fly the plane and he'd jump out. He'd make parachute jumps right over Maysville every Saturday. Just get five or ten dollars out of it. And he usually would drift out and land in, in Dad's cotton patch. And uh, but he, he, he was uh, he was a shrewd character and he was uh, he had a lot of ability. And so he went on up, you know, and he got involved with different people and backers and made his world flights and this and that. And then, of course, later he was killed with uh, Will Rogers yeah. up here at Point Barra in Alaska mm -hmm. on one of their Arctic expeditions. But he was a nice guy. Who was your father? My father was Ellie Hugh McNeese, E-L-I-H-U-E, Ellie Hugh McNeese. And your mother? 
Rebecca. What was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Ring. Ring. R I N G. R I N G. Okay. And were you folks from Oklahoma originally? They were from Arkansas. Dad was a little orphan kid down there. And he was wanting to marry my mother. And her family objected to it. And so they ran off and, and uh, went down to Gainesville, Oklahoma. They were married at Gainesville, Oklahoma. And then they came on up and they sailed down around Stratford, a little town named Asher, down in the Indian Territory. And uh, they were just kids, 16, 17 years old. And Dad uh, drove uh, my wagon trains from from down around Asher up to Arkansas City. That was the first rail head point at that time. This was back in the Territory days, back in 1898 or or 1900, right about then, in that area. And then Dad began to share crop and farm down in around Paul's Valley, on the Washington River, just west of Paul's Valley, in Maysville. Uh, you said they were married at Gainesville? Gainesville, Texas. Texas, okay. Um, so you went through high school, or went through school at Maysville? Ponca City, Oklahoma. We moved up here right after the Depression. We moved to Ponca City in 1931. Okay, why did the family move to Ponca City? Just seek any kind of work they could at that time. You know, Continental and Marlin Oil Company and several others were doing pretty good here. And there was some work here and there was no work in around Maysville. So we moved up here. I finished school up here, started in seventh grade, and went through high school. What was it like around Maysville in the Depression? It was terrible down there. All the banks were busted, and all the landowners were busted. You know, it was it was real rough. In fact, uh, the last two years that we were there, the last two years that we were there, we all would drive out here to West Texas mm -hmm. and pull bowls. We'd pull cotton bowls working the fields out there and pull bowls from daylight to dark for twenty five cents a hunt. And we would try to get enough money. Of course, it was mother and dad, and then my sister, who was younger than I, and one sister that was older, and two sisters that was older, and one brother that was old, five or six of them. And we could make enough money out there pulling bowls, you know, for a couple of months to all uh, get us through the winter. I can remember in the year of 1931, when we came out of Texas, we stopped at Amarillo on top of the Camp Rock. And we went in a big country store there, and uh, they had pinto beans on sale for three and a quarter cents a pound. And we bought three 100 pound sacks of pinto beans. I distinctly remember it. We paid three dollars and 25 cents for a 100 pound sack of beans. But that's the that times was real tough. Mm -hmm. uh, did many folks around Maysville go to California? Lots of them, yes. Did your family ever consider going? No, we didn't. Mm -hmm. No, we were we were strictly farm people, and there was a most of the people that went to California were were small family units, you know, like two, three, maybe a man, and wife, and a couple of kids. But see, there was six or seven of us still at home at that time, including mother and dad. So we never did attempt to go to California. Mm -hmm. There was some kind of farm work generally, you know, seasonally. You can make the the uh, room corn season at Maysville. You can make the cotton uh, harvest and the maize harvest in high gear in West Texas, and later in the year, and then come on back and and uh, we used to cut wood in the winter up here after all crops were harvested. We would drive nine miles out the country out here and cut wood for a dollar and a half a rick. Cut it with cross cut saw and double bit axe. We give the farmer, the farmer or rancher who we were harvesting the timber off, but we give him one rick and we'd keep one, and we'd haul it back to Pomp City and sell it for a dollar and a half a rick. And that's the way we lived until, uh, well, the first three years that we were here. And at that time, I think it was pretty common throughout the country. But at that time, Pomp City, Oklahoma, high school out here had kind of a semi-professional high school football team. <laughs> At one time we had uh, boys from five different states playing on this high school squad. And uh, fortunately, uh, 
they asked me to come out. I had played three years down junior high school, and the football coach asked me to come out and work out with him in spring practice. And I was in the ninth grade, and I thought, you know, no way that I wouldn't be able to attend school the following year anyway, you know. And there was no need for me to get out there at that bunch of bruisers he had. That was when Waddy Young, who made first all of one of the all best All Americans out here at OU, and Ralph Stevenson, Cossey Roper, boys like that. I mean, they were huge men. They were they were men. Mm -hmm. Kids played till they were 21 years old. I uh, the last season that I played, I graduated on May the 25th, one day after I was 20 years old, 21 years old. But uh, they gave me an opportunity to come out and work out with them and told me that, that they'd see to it that I had enough money to support my family and this and that if I could make the team. So I went out and made their team and uh, well, they got me a job working at the fire department here at Park City of School Board. We would work from uh, 6 in the evening until 7 in the morning and then attend school during the day. <clears throat> and I went to work for $35 a month, which was uh, better than most of the family incomes at that time. He was supporting the, the team. He was... The, the local merchants and local ranchers merchants. around him. Yeah. And at one time, there was 17 of us working at the fire department. Hmm. And then uh, the uh, funeral home here, Miles Funeral Home, not Miles, but Gil Lester always kept one or two employed. Uh, Paul Long, who had a wholesale distributorship for Conoco, he kept one or two employed. Hal kept one or two employed. The merchants here locally supported the program very strongly. And in the season, who would you play? Well, we played Oklahoma City and Tulsa, the uh, uh, Guthrie, Edmund, oh. uh, uh, Ardmore, and uh, Blackwell, we always had a game with Blackwell each year. We played Perry every year. Uh, we played the biggest teams in the state. What was your record? We had good record. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just averagely speaking. Oh, yeah. we'd, we'd usually win uh, uh, around 80% of the game. Mm -hmm. We had a good team. Jack Baker was the coach here at that time. He went on down to OSU and was assistant down there for several years. What do the other people think about it? They know that this is a semi-pro team. Well, like I say, I think it was pretty common all over the yeah. country at that time. You know, the time was pretty tough. Maybe a lot of kids didn't have any other opportunity or way to even get an education. So I think it was pretty common. So you graduated in May of what year? Of uh, 1939. 39. What did you do after high school? I worked one more year with the fire department here and I got into some problems, you know, brawling and fighting and drinking around here in these joints. And then I left here and went down to all Houston, Texas and worked in a shipbuilding yard there. Uh, this was when the United States really saw that, that they were going to get into this, that it was going to be a worldwide conflagration. I went down and worked in a shipyard in Houston, Texas for about six months and then left there and went to Little Rock, Arkansas with the War Department and, and their firefighting units. Um, when you, after high school, where did the whiskey come from around here in Ponca City? The what? The whiskey? The whiskey. Was it made or was it uh, shipped in? Or? A lot of it was made right here locally and then, and then there was a lot of bonded whiskey that was shipped in and it was readily available. How did the moonshiners deliver the whiskey around here? How did they want? Deliver the whiskey. Oh, they just had it. Uh, there was 10 or 12 places right at Ponca City that you just walk in and buy as much whiskey as you want. Revenue didn't bother them? No, no, they didn't bother them. Okay. And tell me about your work at Houston. What were you doing down there? I was a uh, gang pusher, and I forget the name of the company that I worked for. I had about uh, 40 men. And we worked on the ways just assembling these mostly LST boats. And uh, uh, well, I just was a gang pusher. Now, what's a gang pusher? That's the foreman That's of a group of men. Okay. You get certain details. You have a work order every morning that they want you to accomplish for the day. And, 
and uh, you have the men at your disposal to do it with. So you're just a gang pusher. You're a boss. And how did you get the job with the War Department as a firefighter? Well, of course, I had been, you know, I had five years, four years experience here as a fireman, and at that time they needed a lot of firemen around all uh, their camps and bases. And at Little Rock, Arkansas, they had a big air base there, you know. Uh, Camp Robinson was the name of it. And they had a lot of aircraft and this and that, and they needed the experienced people and needed them quickly because of the increase in armaments and planes and in buildings and that sort of thing. So they ran an advertisement in the paper that they wanted to have, uh, firefighters. What was your salary with the War Department at that time? <coughs> it was very small. I think it was all, I believe it was $120 a month. Now were you a military or were you civilian? I was civilian. You were civilian. Civilian with the, with the War Department. And you went to Little Rock in what year? I went to Little Rock in 1940 because uh, I was in the town of Little Rock itself the night that they, the, the day that they bombed Hawaii. Yeah. What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, of course, I immediately with I was with the War Department at the time, so I had total exemption. Mm -hmm. They had already started the draft in '39, and I was totally exempt because of my association with the War Department. I was declared to be an essential employee. And of course, when all uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Of course, it infuriated me to think, you know, that they would pull that sort of thing. I, I think a war, war should be held just like Sherman said. It should be fought with the most intensity it can. But that was a sneak attack altogether, you know. And war hadn't been declared, and so it infuriated me. I was totally upset by it, and I immediately had a desire to enter the service, but uh, at about the same time that this happened, shortly after this happened, uh, uh, a brother-in-law of mine called me and they said that they were putting in a bomb storage arsenal at Pine Bluff, Arkansas. There's going to be a 60 all bomb storage buildings in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, big arsenal. Like and at this time they had, all, uh, of course, this we're going to have to. I'm going to be careful what to say here. Now. Uh, they had about 250 black men from Louisiana, Mississippi, and down in there that was doing most of the concrete work out there, pouring all the forms and slabs and, and this sort of thing. And they were having lots of problems controlling them and getting them to stay on the job and work and this and that on pay periods, on payday. They were paying them on Saturday nights, on Friday nights. And then you'd have a lot of absenteeism because of the, of the weekend party and they would do and having money in their pocket and this and that. So they were having considerable problems along that line. And then at that time, this was a time contract that uh, Beulah's Construction Company was, was working out of Oklahoma City. And so they needed to get the work done and get it on time because they were going to be fined uh, $10 per day for each of the 60 buildings that weren't completed by a deadline. So my brother-in-law called me and asked me if I would come down and, and start pushing these black men, be a gang pusher there, and oversee the, the black men that were working on the project. So I went down there and worked for them. Well, until uh, 1942, I worked a little over a year until we got the project completed. Then I came back to Fox City to visit my folks, and I was still in the museum category, you know. And I still kept thinking I ought to get in the services. I was a young man, 22 years old, and really felt like that that's where I ought to be, was in the military services. And so I came home and I got into a big brawl, drunken spree down here in uh, Park City. And uh, I uh, saw right away that they was after me pretty hot and heavy, the local constabulary was. And so I thought immediately, about that time they had all uh,
they had experimented and come pretty well along with airborne services. Do mm -hmm. you need something, sir? No. Or am I in the wrong no. position? No, that's fine. But the, uh, the Germans had used all airborne units pretty effectively in different places overseas. So in about 1940, the Army began to experiment with them here with a platoon of men down in Panama. And they had proven it to be an effective thing and thought that it was going to be a necessary thing. So they had begun to try to, to get people engaged in airborne services, but it was all a volunteer thing. And uh, they couldn't draft people and put them in the airborne, in parachute service. So at that time when I got messed up here and was in a lot of trouble, I thought the best thing I can do is, is to run right straight to Oklahoma City and uh, volunteer and get an airborne search. And that way if I can get down there and get that deal closed, well then the law can't touch me here because the Army would have priority. So I did. I ran down to Oklahoma City and, and uh, told them that I would like to volunteer for military services but that I, but that only the airborne was acceptable as far as I was concerned. That, that was the type of warfare I wanted to be engaged in. So I went down and enlisted in September of 1942, straight into airborne service, and was was immediately sent to uh, to Kua, Georgia, and I was in the first airborne uh, regiment that the United States ever activated, the 506. 506 Airborne. How did your, the trouble you got in, in Ponca City affect your status with the War Department? Uh, none. It wouldn't have affected it in any wise. But you gave that up to go in the Airborne? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I needed to be in the service. I felt that's where I ought to be. And you thought the police here were after you hot and heavy? Oh, I knew they were after me hot and heavy, but it wasn't a, uh, a real criminal thing. It yeah. was just, uh, well, they they could have stuck me with assault and battery. I had uh, damaged a man pretty severely, not with weapons of any kind, you know, just in a brawl. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been a real uh, serious charge. It would have been assault and battery and, yeah. and drunk and disorderly and destruction of property, a few things like that. But it would have been a minor charge. But I didn't want to go through it. I really wanted to be in the service. I so where'd you go for your basic? Went to Tacoa, Georgia. That's right on the northern line of Tacoa, of Georgia. And uh, we were supposed to be there six weeks taking uh, uh, physical training, our, our basic, and then go from there to Fort Benning, Georgia, which was the airborne center at that time, and still is to this day. And uh, then we would make our five qualifying jumps. You had to make five parachute jumps in order to be a qualified paratrooper. Tell me about your first jump. Uh, strange as it may seem, the first jump is probably the easiest one you ever make because you are not aware of all the things that can happen. You know, you don't know, uh, you have never seen any May West, you haven't seen any streamers. You have never seen a guy uh, shoot hang on the tail of the plane and various other things that, that finally you become familiar with and you realize that it is effective and can happen to you at any minute. So the first jump, you're really excited, but you're not really frightened. You, you know that thousands of other guys have done it, and apparently with great success, very low casualties. So you jump pretty easy the first time, generally speaking. If a guy uh, if a guy freezes, if a guy freezes in a plane, there's no way to get him out. Some guys go up and feel very confident that they can jump. But when it comes to to getting out of that door they can't do it. <laughs> they actually become paralyzed or just go bananas. And there's no way you can throw them out or force them out or, or coerce them or any other way. No method can get them out of that plane. But for most guys the first jump is a good one. You know, and then, uh, but you see a few guys getting banged up, you know, backs broken and legs broken and people totally disabled, and you see a few deaths down in the jump field. And uh, so the second one, you may have a little bit of reservation, and you can, uh, you can withdraw from this 
service anytime you want to until you make the fifth jump. If you make your first and second, third and fourth, and then you decide you don't want it, why you just walk in and say, I'm through. And they get rid of you right quick. They didn't want anyone that wasn't perfectly willing and able to participate. At this time, this was very early in airborne units, and out of every 1,000 men that volunteered, about uh, 900 of them were disqualified physically. They couldn't take the training and so forth. They would break in that limit. And then out of the next 100, why, usually casualties and different things would reduce it down to about 10. So there's only getting about 10 out of every 1,000 that volunteered. And nearly everybody that volunteered were young men, 17, 18 years old. But uh, you could back out any time you wanted to up to the fifth jump. They only wanted men that was going to be there because they definitely wanted to be there. That's the beautiful thing about uh, airborne service is that every guy that's fighting with you or beside you or behind you or in front of you is there because he wants to be and because he feels like he is the best a specimen in military services. It's not like fighting with infantry or artillery or tankers. 90% uh, of them had been drafted and they didn't necessarily want to be there. And you couldn't really count them. I'm not being derogative in this, but I mean there's a, there's two different types of people. So, so after the fifth jump you're your hook. After the fifth jump, you're hooked. You're a paratrooper, and the only way then that you get out of it is through disability or, or maybe a, a attitude could, or criminal acts that you might make. So, how long did your paratroop pain last? I was actually in the services about four weeks before we left there. They they reduced the training because they thought that we had qualified in the physical end of it. And then it took us about two weeks after we got down to Port Benning to complete our five jumps. And then we were paratroopers shortly after the first of the year. And where did they send the 506? The 506, uh, we were moved around considerably. Uh, an issue, you mean in the United States, right? Yeah. Uh, we were at Fort Benning, then we were at Fort Bragg, and we were at all Camp Camel, Kentucky, and then we went back to to then we went up to Evansville, Illinois, for the 43 maneuvers. They were maneuvered in Tennessee that year, and we went up to Evansville. And they had an airstrip up there, and I even forget the name of the camp we were in. But all uh, we would fly down. We would embark in planes from uh, Evansville, and we would fly down. We would jump on one side of Nashville one week, and then we would after we would maneuver a week with the army there. Well, then we would uh, grab planes to go back to to uh, Evansville, and then the next week we would jump. We jumped on. We made four jumps in the maneuvers that year, one on either side of Nashville. And Tennessee Mountains. And after that we went right back to Fort Bragg and they equipped us and shipped us to all uh, to uh, Camp Kelvin, New Jersey. That was point of embarkation. They checked everything there and moved us right on overseas in, in uh, October of 43. So we were on the state side about a year. Uh, did they give you wings when you yeah. got what were the what the first things look like? Uh, they're a uh, they're a pair of wings with a parachute just canopy like and the shroud lines coming down through the wing. They just like they are. They're today. silver wings. Yeah, they're the same as they are same today. Way. Tell me about your comm commencement exercises in that first regiment. Did you have a, an exercise? Oh no, no, it was just slam, bam, 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 and it's rushing us through it, trying to get us ready for combat immediately. There Tell me no about your trip to Europe. Trip to Europe, uh, that was a mess. We went over on on a big uh, uh, English steamship uh, from the Star Lines, and the name of it was the SS Samaria. And it held 
nearly 5,000 troops. And we went in a convoy up through the North Seas and the, by Greenland and Newfoundland and there. It took us about nine days to cross. And we uh, docked at Liverpool. And Any the, incidents on the trip that you can recall? No, no. They had, they were some, they, they were some submarine activity out on the fringes of the convoy. Uh, but we had good aerial escort. Where'd you stay in the ship? What, what kind of quarters did you have? Ah, uh, the quarters were terrible. You just slept. Uh, a few of the guys had hammocks. The rest of us just slept in sleeping bags on the floor. And the chow was terrible. Uh, they only fed twice a day, and all. The two meals that you got per day was these English rations. And black breakfast would normally uh, consist of uh, stewed tomatoes, no seasoning of any sort, you know, or Brussels sprouts, or carrots, and uh, once in a while you would get some meat, and it was mostly mutton, terrible stuff. And uh, their coffee was, was bad. Uh, they did have a commissary on their PXs. And that's what most of the guys lived off of, was just candy and cookies and anything they could buy out of it. The weather was rough. It was in October, and those seas are bad up there at that time of the year. So it was a pretty rough trip, but this boat was, man, it was a monster. You could hardly tell that the weather affected it. So you landed at Liverpool? Liverpool, yeah. Tell me about England. England is a real peculiar country. It's peculiar, especially to people who grew up in this section of the United States. It's just a little tiny spot. It's real crowded. They've got 60, 70 million people living there in an area probably not as big as Texas. I don't know exactly how big the island is, but uh, it looks like a, it looks totally like a Christmas card scene. Is what it reminds me of. Though they still have thatch roofs on most of the buildings over there, houses, dwellings, you know, just straw, and it's a hundred years old, that straw is a hundred years old, and a uh, uh, little bit, no yards, the houses are built right on the street, you know, just sidewalk in the gutter, and they don't have any uh, back alley, you know, any areas behind the places for, for space, it's so crowded. And the little roads are narrow, little roads they were at that time, you know. In fact, uh, some of the some of the bridges in the area where we were, we went down near Swindon. And oh, down there, uh, there's still some old Roman bridges, there arch bridges that they're using on their roads that was built back like in, uh, 2,000 years ago. But they have little tiny roads, and their vehicles are small. They drive on the left-hand side of the street. Uh, they, uh, of course, at that time, they had been engaged in this war for quite some time. This was in 43 when we got there, and they had been in it hot and heavy ever since about 39, see. So the country was pretty devastated. The uh, Germans had had total aero supremacy for a long, long time. And they had riddled all the industrial cities in London and everything else. And uh, the people were really in dire need of, of just common produce to sustain life as far as eating was concerned. Uh, their fuel was, you need to change that. Yeah, just fuel supplies were, were real low and uh, when those limeys, of course, 90% of them rode bicycles. They didn't have automobiles. But if they were riding up the street and there was a bush or something that a limb had dropped off of, it was a piece, a little finger, they'd stop and get it, take it home for fuel. <coughs> and their coal, they burned coal 90% of the time in their homes. And it was real rationed. Uh, they didn't even know what an electric icebox was. Each one of them had a cooler type deal built in a window. And they called it a cool box. And they set milk or cream or if they could get a hold of that stuff and cheese or vegetables in those windows. It was totally a different thing than we had ever seen. Uh, 
they do not have, they didn't have such things as supermarkets like we've got or our Humpty Dumpty stores or that thing. They had several little stores uptown. One would sell bread only and one would sell fish only. And the next one would sell all oh, vegetables and the next one would be a little butcher market. Of course, there wasn't much of a supply of that. Uh, it was totally different and everything was, the landscape, uh, the farms and everything looked like yards. There was no, there's very few trees or anything on the whole island. But most of the land over there is owned by lords and ladies and wealthy people. And uh, they own everything that's on that land or in the river that runs through it. They own all the fish, all the wildlife, and all this. And no hunting or fishing is permitted except to their guests. Of course, our rations were quite bad at that time. We were stationed on Sir Ernest Wells' estate right outside of Hungerford, England. And uh, uh, he had a kind of a little game reserve on his. He was the biggest cigarette person in England, I guess, at that time. He was very, very well. He had this huge manor house there, but we lived in all uh, once at huts uh, along the drive going into this place. But he had kind of like a little game preserve on there. He had about a hundred of these psycho and foul of deer. And there was rabbits all over the place, and pheasants and quail. And then this river Kennet ran through his place, and it's full of jack salmon and trout. And he had diverted it and made two hatcheries on his place where he raised trout and jack salmon. And of course, our rations were so sorry, it would, it, it repulsed you just to get close to the mess hall. So I had this bunch that was called the Filthy 13, and we didn't pay attention to regulations or anything else. And uh, every night I'd go out and either kill a deer, or I'd go down and gig all the fish I wanted, or we'd go out and kill all the rabbits or pheasants that was available that we needed, you know, to supply us. And we cooked everything in our little ponce of hut. We never even went close to the mess hall. They were still on that Brussels sprouts and stewed tomato and mutton deal. So we, we kept our menus totally separate. I got a Christmas card this year from a Mexican boy down in, in El Paso, Texas. And he says, Jake, he said, you and that filthy 13 were real super men. He said, I remember how y'all used to eat four meals every day. He said, they lasted about midnight or one o'clock. He said, you ate deer and rabbit and pheasant and fish. And he said, if I even had as much as a as a donut after I came in off one of them night problems, he said, I got indigestion. He said, y'all were super men and had super stomachs. <laughs> but it's a, it's a pretty little place. It's mm -hmm. clean. It's immaculate. Everything's real tidy. Did you get in trouble for poaching the animals? Oh, yeah. They they knew we were doing it. Uh, they finally called us in. Sir Ernest Wells came out one day to visit uh, his place and check it out. They had a crash dump down not too far from the manor house. And he was down around it. And he saw all these fish heads and deer hides and antlers and all this stuff laying around and feathers. So he immediately began to make a survey of his estate to find out exactly why much was missing. And of course he saw his hatcheries were nearly empty of fish and he knew how many was supposed to be in it. So he submitted a bill to the United States government, the Army to pay for all this stuff. Well, the officers immediately had funneled down from division headquarters through uh, Maxwell Taylor and so forth, right down to Colonel Sink, and then from Colonel Sink down to Ridgemill Headquarters Company, who was stationed there. And said they had, that we had to come up with that money. Well, of course, none of us had. None of the men even had money. We spent every penny we got. We all denied it anyway, you know, and said we were innocent. We hadn't touched any of this stuff. So it boiled down that the officers finally had to pay for all of that out of their stuff. And uh, Captain Daniels, he called all of us out, fell us out in company formation, and he said, this is going to stop as of right now. This is going to cost each officer in here so many pounds and so forth. And said, I don't want another rabbit, pheasant, or anything killed. And no more fish taken, and no more deer poached at night, and this and that. And and he said, uh, MacNeese, he says, do you understand what I'm saying? And I looked at Captain Daniels. I said, Captain Daniels, I said, I'm offended at your attitude. 
I said, uh, you making a very accusatory tone here and address me in this manner. I said, I'm totally innocent. I said, I've never touched anything. Well, of course, he knew that, that uh, I was killing it day by day and night by night. We never went, my, my group of people never went to a mess hall. Uh, the officers would go down to Swindon, London, uh, Swindon, England, which was about 30 or 40 miles from us, and they would buy cast barrels of beer down there from this uh, Lyons Brewery, I believe it was Lyons Brewery. I drank a million barrels of their, of their beer. But uh, anyway, every time they got in a load of these barrels of beer, they'd get anywhere from three to five for the officers' quarters down there. Why? Me and my boys would steal so much of it every time we had a rack set up in our barracks and all. I had just a regular draft beer or cooking utensils and all this and that. And, and we would steal butter and stuff like that out of the mess hall to use to cook and fry with. So he knew all this was going on. And he said, Mike Nese, he says, I want to tell you something. He said, uh, have you ever been in England? No. Well, all right. And you were asking what it was like. It's always damp and wet and foggy over there. It never snows very rarely because there's nobody. It rains constantly and fog and this and that. And over there in England, when it is, when it's pitch dark and they have a fog come in on you, it's just like being totally blunt. You lose all sense of direction and everything else. And old Captain Daniels looked at me and he said, Listen, Mike, and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, They could blindfold me and put me in the back of a, of a six-wheel truck and drive me in circles around here for two or three hours, blindfolded. And he said, if they would let me out anywhere within two miles of this camp, he said, I could walk straight to the door of your Quonset hut. And I said, uh, usually you couldn't even go from your Quonset hut to the restroom, to the latrine." I said, well, how could you do that, Captain Daniel? He said, I would just have to follow my nose. He said, that place of yours smells like a, a Mexican or a nigger or hamburger joint. He said, you'd smell it for two miles. He said, you haven't been to mess hall in, in months. He said, I know where, who's doing this and this and that and so forth, but they couldn't prove it, of course. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, took, they looked uh, great askance at, at the way we were living. Who had the idea for the Filthy Thirteen? Well, it really all started right down there at all. Tacoa, Georgia, just quick as we got in, they had us in five-man tents. And uh, we were living out there just in the boondocks in these five-man tents. This was in September, the month of September and October. It was a rainy season there in Georgia. And these tents didn't have any floors in them or anything else. And you had all your stuff sitting right on the ground. And, of course, it was impossible to stay clean. So they had five men in a tent that was alphabetically. They had uh, myself and Majewski and a kid named Leo, one named Lip, and a kid named Milo. And they called us the Dirty Five because we were just really, we didn't try, you know. I had gone in there just to fight a war and get over with, and I didn't care anything about military discipline and courtesy and salute and taking care of all that deal. And so we didn't salute very many people, and we didn't have much military courtesy. Well, they called us the Dirty Five because we were so dirty. And then we began to bust up, and, and uh, uh, I was I was in the service for three years, five months, and 26 days, and so many hours and so many minutes, and I never made PFC. My attitude was wrong. I was in trouble from the day I got there until the day I left. And uh, so uh, they never, I never made the rating of PFC, but when uh, uh, all the time that, that we were in training, I was uh, an acting non-commissioned officer. I was either a corporal or a sergeant or a book sergeant or a staff or a first sergeant. And I would perform those duties all the time, but it's all on an acting basis. I'd be above private, and I didn't get any pay for it. But the minute that I would jump in behind the lines, they had to make my grade effective that I was acting. And I got paid for all the time that I was, was behind the lines for the grade that I was occupying. 
and then the minute I would get out, I'd go AWOL or something. Within a week, I'd be busted right back down to Buck Price. So I never made PFC all the time I was in there. But uh, when uh, when they would get, when other sergeants would get uh, a paratrooper that was rebellious or, or just didn't give a hoot about courtesy and discipline and so forth, and maybe he'd punch a sergeant eye or, or something, you know, why they would stick him over in my squad because they figured, you know, that he would be with people of a similar attitude and that, that I could control him as far as I wanted to control him. And they knew that we were, they were, nearly every one of them were excellent combat soldiers, but they were sorry garrison soldiers. So uh, I was in a demolition saboteur platoon is what I was in. And of course, uh, the meaner a man was, the better soldier he was in my opinion. And that was what I wanted was the meanest and roughest people I could get a hold of. Now were you in charge of this unit? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it was my unit. I was sergeant. So that's how that's how it really began to develop. And then when we got over like when we got over to England, when we re reached England, we were out on this Cernest Wells Manor place. He had uh, six or seven automobiles there at the manor house. And they would wash them every day. But the water supply was so low and so rationed that we could only take a bath once a week. And this was set up for Saturday. Well, come Saturday, I wanted to have my coon dog in London and pick a daily circus with all them in the middle of that red light district raised cane. I didn't want to be standing in line out there for two hours wasting my time waiting for a bath. So what the boys and I would do, we would just... We'd get our passes well and we'd head out just in our our junk clothes. And then we would get into London and go to one of these Red Cross deals <coughs> and take a bath and change our clothes. And we'd raise cane in there until Monday. Excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom. Sure. So we're allowed one scuttle of coal per day to heat this whole building that was about, oh, it must have been uh, 35 feet long, a Quonset hut. That was what we were allowed per day to heat this building. Of course, uh, you were expected to wash your own clothes, you know, and uh, uh, that was an impossibility. You couldn't wash, you couldn't heat enough water to wash your uniform. So we didn't wash our uniforms at all. We just left it as was. We didn't shave until we got ready to go to town. We were just entirely rebellious. They had uh, these quantities huts had all uh, uh, brick floors in them. Not any two bricks were even. They were all, you know, one was either elevated or, or lowered. And we were supposed to mop those and keep them clean and we told them we wouldn't even touch them. You know, just let it build up in there until it all got level and smooth as far as we <laughs> were concerned. But we didn't wash our clothes. And we were sleeping on shuck mattresses on, on wire frames. And these shuck mattresses were where the shucks in them was filthy, just full of dirt and dust. So in reality, in reality, the the most sanitary way to do it was sleep with all your clothes on. If you strip down to your underwear, boy, you come out of there as black as the inside of a stovepipe in the morning. So in order to stay clean, really clean, sanitary, we slept with our clothes, fully clothed every night. We didn't even take our boots off. We just pile in that thing full of blanket over us to sleep that way. That gave you quite a bit more sleep through the night. You didn't have to get up and get dressed early for Reveille and all that crap, see. And uh, so they called us the Filthy 13. Uh, the name just grew because of our general character and attitude and this and that. And we didn't take any BS off of officers or any other NCO. We didn't go out of our way, you know, to uh, be obnoxious. But we also didn't take any crap off of any of them. And they were the finest group of soldiers in the whole outfit, combat soldiers. They knew it, and they, they wanted to use them. We were combat, uh, we were uh, demolition saboteurs, and uh, we were elite. We were the best. Um, we got in lots of problems in town. On the drunk would they try to 
make you guys straighten up or the officers? Oh, or? They, they had tried to, but they, they saw it didn't work, and so then they just kind of isolated us. Every time that they would get one they couldn't control, they'd give him to me because that segregated us from the rest of the guys. We didn't contaminate the other barracks, and our attitude was not reflected in other portions of it. So they didn't mess with you? Oh, they, no, they didn't mess with us much. They threw us in the stockade quite a bit. When we left Akoa, Georgia, when we got ready to make our first jumps, that's when we had this dirty fight. Blue Lip and Milan Majewski. Milan and a kid named Majewski and a kid named Lee and I went into town to celebrate. And I had been in a lot of trouble before. Uh, they came around one day and they have all retreat. Are you familiar with retreat? That's at five o'clock in the evening. They blow a few come on. Everybody climbs up and stands at rigid attention and this and that. Well, I decided I didn't want any part of the retreat, you know, if that wasn't. I couldn't see any sense in it. So I didn't go to retreat that evening. We would we we would get up at we would get up sometimes as early as four thirty in the morning and they had the what they call our Mount Curry, which was our insignia, our, that's our great great mountain insignia is Mount Curry. And that mountain was it was three miles from the base of it to the top of it. And of course the same distance down. And we'd get up at four thirty in the morning and we would run that that mountain there in forty five minutes. Before, this before breakfast, and then you just went into physical training all day long. It was uh, besides the physical training. Well, of course, you were taking technical training on demolitions and saboteur and, and various other phases of your field. But they would work you like that until five o'clock, about ten minutes till five. And then they bring you at ten minutes to five. Of course, you're supposed to jump in then, take a shave, shine, and a shower, and get dressed and be out there to retreat. So I thought, well, this is stupid. I have no part of it. So I didn't go that evening. And of course, they when they uh, in this company formation, by the first sergeant, he calls them all to attention, and, and then he calls for a report. And each sergeant, you know, reports, you know, like all uh, first battalion demolition section president accounted for, or first battalion demolition section present except for so and so and so and so and he's absent not accounted for. They gave a report every day. So he reported me missing that day, Sergeant Johnson did. So the top kick told him, said, find out where Magnesia did. Yeah. And our first sergeant was a regular army man. He was from, from uh, Hickory, Georgia, and he'd been in the army twelve years already when this thing came along. But a lot of rural boys, you know, were in the military at that time. So Johnson came to me and, and he said to Mike Nancy, he said, uh, I had to report you absent and unaccounted for at retreat today. He said, where were you? And I said, I was over at the PA. He said, what are you doing over at the PA? And I said, uh, I was drinking beer and eating peanuts. He said, well, why? And I said, because I like beer and peanuts. And I said, I don't like retreat. I said, it fouls up my religion. He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, John, I said, uh, my mother is Indian. I said, my dad is Irish. I said, he's Catholic. And I said, my mother is a nature worshiper. And I said, I adopted her religion rather than the Catholicism. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, she's, I said, that we just worship nature. I said, like the sun, the moon, stars, fire, thunder, rain snow, things of nature. And it's not man-made. He said, what the has that got to do with retreat? And I said, well, I said, y'all got that organ grinder swing out there. I said, that's a mechanical instrument created by man. I said, you got that flag hanging out there. I said, that's another creation of man's. And I said, you want me to salute it and all that? And I said, that would uh, violate all the principles and scruples of my religion. So I said, I, I won't go. He said, well, you have to. He says, everybody stands for the truth. I said, not me. I said, look, man, I said, no. this country was established on religious freedom, the principles of religious freedom. I said, if it wasn't for that, they wouldn't even be in America. And I said, I know my rights. And I said, I'm not going to let you violate them. Well, he couldn't hardly believe what he was hearing. <laughs> 
<laughs> but he went back and he told the first sergeant. So the first sergeant says, you see to it that he's there tomorrow. So Johnson, he'd threaten me, you know, and he'd plead and he'd beg and, and I wouldn't show. So after that went on for about a week, but he told me that the first sergeant wanted me to report in to him. So I went in and I reported to call kid and he uh, starts this deal all over again. So I said, oh no. I said, no way. He said, you've got to stand there. He said, everybody does. He said, there's five million men that stand there. For and I said, this one doesn't. So he'd threaten and he'd plead and he'd beg and I just refused to stand. Well, this went on for about a week with him. Then he turned it over to the executive officer and the executive officer, he was a little stupid kid that had gone through OCS, you know, and he didn't know anything about it either. And so he would try and he'd beg and he'd plead and he'd offer me different things. And I said, no way. And so the next day they said, uh, report into the company command, Captain Hannah. Well, this Captain Hannah, he was from up there in Lawrence, Kansas. He was an attorney and he was a West Point. He was sharp, boy. He was shrewd. And uh, after he came out of service, he was up here in Joliet, Illinois. I taught in their law school up there for, well, ever since World War II. I've seen him every year or so at a get together that I have for the guy. And uh, so uh, I reported in to Captain Hannah. And it's in a little old room, maybe as big as our living room was the orderly room. The first sergeant's desk was right there, and the executive officer's desk was right beside his, and then Captain Hannah's was over in this corner. And this first sergeant and this executive officer, they're sitting there just on the edge of the chair, going to listen to all this crap. So, so I walked in, and I salute, and I said, Mike, nice reporting this work. He says, Private Mike Nace, he says, I understand you're having some trouble with the recruit. And I said, no, sir, I'm not having any trouble with the recruit. He said, uh, let me word that another way. He says, I understand you refuse to stand recruit. I said, that's right, sir. And he said, and why? And I said, well, and I had told this story so many times that I had memorized verbatim, you know. I had even kind of began to believe it myself. And so I'd give him this long speech mother and dad and me being a nature worshiper and I knew my rights and the country established all the principles of religious freedoms. And I said I volunteered for parachute duty. I said I haven't been drafted. I said I enlisted and volunteered for this. I said if you can teach me how to kill the German, I said I'll go there and kill him as long as I can find him. I said I don't object to that. But I said I am a conscientious objector to retreat. And he looked at me and he said, Mac Nace, he said, uh, you have broken nearly every regulation that the Army's got. He said, you've only been here a month. And he said, you've violated nearly every regulation we have. He said, I don't think you have any religion. He said, you know, a peculiar thing about this is, he says, out of all the five million people in the military service today, he said, you're the only one that has made this profession. Well, I said, well, that doesn't surprise me. I said, it's a very small group. I said, a very exclusive bunch of people belong to this. I said, that doesn't astound me. And he said, well, that's not working here. He said, you are going to stand with free. And I said, are you giving me a direct order? to stand retreat, knowing that it will violate every scruple and principle of my religion. And I said, are you going to do that? He said, yeah. And I kind of grinned. I said, well, that's all I've been waiting for. <laughs> 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 and that top kick in this executive officer, he said, okay. He said, you be at retreat to see it. I said, okay, no problem. So that evening, I stood retreat but that night, we was getting ready to ship out in about two weeks to go down to Fort Bain and make our final qualifying jump. So we went in town that evening, it was payday, and we had a little money in our pocket. So my tent, this five, the dirty five, went into Tacoma, Georgia, and they had, you could buy all the whiskey you wanted down in one part of town, but it was restricted, it's off limits. So we'd go down there and we'd buy some fifth whiskey and we'd take it back up in Tacoma. 
and we'd drink it, and we'd go back and we'd get another. And, and we made a half dozen trips down there, and we finally decided, you know, that we was wearing out our whiskey just traveling back and forth to Mutant. And so we decided we was going to stay right there and drink our whiskey. Well, this guy that was selling it, he said, no, y'all got to get out and get your whiskey and go. He said, you'll have a dozen MPs in here on the way to close me in. Well, we wouldn't leave. Well, finally the MPs came, and three of them ran out the back door, and Mylan and I just walked out the front door. And Mylan was a little short kid. He's ex-pug from... Cleveland, Ohio, tough as a boot. But he wasn't five foot tall, I don't think. But he stumbled and fell down these steps and rolled out into the gutter as we made exit out of this place. And these two MPs charge in on us, you know. And uh, one of them reached down and got a hold of Shorty and started to pick him up. And Shorty started tight. And so this guy took a swing at him with his nightstick, this MP did. And I just stuck my hand out and warded it all. And I said, don't hit that kid with that nice stick. I said, he's so drunk he can't even defend himself. I said, he couldn't attack you. And this guy said, I'll hit him with this nice stick any time and get ready. He was an MP. So he took another cut at him. And when he did, well, I grabbed that nice stick and wrenched it out of his hand. And I whipped him and this other MP and I just beat him down to the ground. And I took their 45s off of them and I shot up all their ammunition, you know, and street lights and whatever was available for targets. And after I got all their ammunition shot up and had them disarmed, you know, I said, now we're ready to go on in. And they you know, well, just take us on in and charge I just didn't want them armed, you know. But I had shot out street lights and I had done this and I had done that. So they had a set of charges that you could have put on a wagon sheet the next morning when I came to it, and they took me back out to camp. And Captain Hannah came up to stockade where I was and asked me, you know, what they were not to do. And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, McNeese, he said, uh, we're just going to be here another couple of weeks. He said, I'll just leave you in here until we get ready to go. He said, I'd rather they be watching you than me. He said, they can control you better than I can. So I only stood to retreat that one night. So, and then I was in the stockade for two weeks. And he asked me, he, Captain Hannah came up, and they was going to make a force march at that time. At that time, the Japanese had made a march of about like 72 miles and so many hours. And so they wanted someone, some unit in the United States to beat that record. So what they planned to do was march the, this battalion of paratroopers that I was training with from Atlanta, Georgia, to Fort Benning, full field quick, in a less lesser time. It was further delay. So Captain Hannah came up, and he said, Jake, he said, uh, do you think you can make this march? He said, no, a lot of guys can't make it. I said, well, I'd make that march, you know, without even breaking a sweat. I said, yeah, that wouldn't be a problem at all. And he said, well, I'll just leave you in here then until we get ready to go. So. Uh, they left me in the stockade there until they got ready to go from there to Atlanta. And they came up and got me up, no charges. I went down and I uh, packed my gear and everything. And they said, uh, uh, anyone that, that lasts clear through the march will all be given a 72-hour pass in the Fort Benning, in the Columbus, right outside of Fort Benning. So we took off on the march, and know. Uh, We marched 42 miles the first day. Of course, it's mostly running, you know. But a lot of the guys took their boots off that night and their feet were so sore and the next morning they could get in heat and get them back on. Some of them went on the back their boots. But they kept uh, these blood buckets falling right along, you know, these, these ambulances driving right along, just picking everybody up and trying to. But uh, it took us three days to make them off. And uh, there was only about 75 of us that lasted clear through. And I didn't have any trouble. I, was, you know, didn't even get a police or break sweat. And so we got into camp, and a little boy named Red Gulch. Well, his name was Arthur Hayes. He was from Boston, Massachusetts. He had a real Boston accent, but he had kind of buddied up with me. He was a Wild West and in rooting tootin' son of a gun. You know, that's what he wanted to be. So I, I started calling him Red Gulch, and so. When we got into camp, uh, in the Fort Benning there, I said, let's get us a shower and give her passes and get out of here. 
So we went right down to the orderly room and told Hockey we want her 72 hour pass. And uh, he wouldn't, uh, he said, You don't want to go to town. He said, You're too tired. He said, Go ahead and get a good night's rest. So I said, Wait a minute, you said you was going to give 72 hour passes. I said, Ready? Yep. <clears throat> so some way they discovered that we had flown clear on past Baston, and uh, there was only ten of us in a stick. So ten of the men was going to jump 35 miles even behind Baston, which was ten miles behind the, the main line. And so we whipped around and got out of there and got back to Shaw Grove and sat down at the airstrip there, and then we went into the war room, and we kind of made some plans for the next day whereby that we would take two plane loads in. I would have the first stick that I would jump out of the lead plane and that if I felt like that we were close enough to Baston to possibly get in that I would throw out orange smoke grenades and they would drop the second stick right on top of me and if I saw that we weren't I would throw out black smoke and they would go somewhere else and make the second attempt. So we flew in there Christmas Eve at about nine o'clock in the morning and I bailed out with my ten men and saw that we were right in between the crowd front lines and the American perimeter and I, we left uh, orange smoke grenades out all over the place. They dropped the other ten right in on top of us and we had uh, set up our CRM force sets and, and radar equipment and infrared lights and panels and we had resupplies coming in there within an hour and a half. Thousands of planes came in, dropped supplies. The troops were out of ammunition and, and all uh, food, medicine. The doctors had been captured and everything. They were in bad shape. But we dropped in there on uh, December the 24th, which was the third combat jump that, that I had made. The average lifetime of a combat paratrooper is one and a half jumps. And that was my third one. And when that mess was over, then we did go back into uh, Shaw Grove again to there, to the Pathfinding Service. And uh, uh, stayed there until April, Friday, April the 13th. And uh, they had getting ready to make the big push across. They had established the bridgehead at Remagen, if you remember and they were getting ready to make the big push into Germany with two or three armies and they had all, uh, they took all nine pathfinding sticks of men and scattered them at air bases back and forth along behind the lines and they held my stick in reserve because we had already made three combat jumps which was impossible, you know, that'd be like two or three tours for a bomber pilot. And, uh, so they were going to hold us in reserve to kind of try to protect us. But uh, I told Lachlan Tillman when it happened, I said, we'll be the, he said, I feel sorry for those poor so-and-sos. He said, uh, I said, why? And he said, well, someone will get a goof. I said, he said, they don't need pathfinders before this is over. He said, someone's going to have to jump. And I kind of grinned. I said, yeah, I said, and it'll be you and me, Lachlan. He said, what do you mean? He said, they're leaving us here to protect us. I said, yeah, but I said, every commanding officer in Europe knows that he can get a hold of Pathfinders at Shaw Grove. And I said, everything will be so mixed up they won't know where else they can get a hold of them. So I said, they'll call us first. And sure enough, on Friday, April the 13th, in 1945 when they called us and we had to jump into Prune, Germany in the middle of the Siegfried Line. Patton's 90th Division had got in there and got cut off and surrounded. So we jumped in there to them and made it out of it finally and got back and then they disbanded Pathfinding Service and we all returned to our companies. And we were just used as shock troops from then on down through the southern Germany and Austrian Alps. Now, on the, on the Battle of the Bulls, where exactly did you jump? You said when you popped the orange tree. Jumped in Baston. Baston, see, all they had was about a two-mile perimeter. Mm -hmm. yeah, a two-mile in diameter would be about a six-mile perimeter. And we landed halfway between, they was about 
oh, 100 yards, 100 to 200 yards between the perimeter defense set up of paratroopers and the seven divisions that was attacked. And we landed right in that no man's land. Which side and, messed up? Uh, the north side. There's an old cemetery out there. We landed right by the cemetery and worked our way in. You've been back over there? No, I haven't been back over there. But one of the guys was, I'll tell you kind of a funny story. The first night that we was in there, we was in a kind of a, a pretty good sized building uptown. It was kind of a chalet or manor house or a big building. And we were in there and they bombed it. They hit it with a bomb that night. They was bombing around the clock in grounds where we didn't have an aircraft. But and they hit this building and caved it in on us and we got out of it. And and I told the guys, I said, we're going to have to go. I said, the closest we can get to that front line, the better off we're going to be. Because they wasn't bombing right on the edge of the perimeter. They was hitting downtown all the time. Because just uh, if they missed by 100 yards or 200 yards, they was into their own men if they're bombing their own thing. I said, the best thing we can do is get on the edge of this perimeter. And then we'll come back early in the morning and set up over here again. So we went right out to the very front lines and got a little farmhouse out there. And in this farmhouse, when we checked it out, when they checked it out, well, there wasn't anyone in it. No civilians was in it. Most of the civilians had already left out of Bastogne ahead of the battle. But there was a half basement in it, and it's full of rutabarkers. And there was um, about 12 chickens in there, and a cow, and a horse. And there was a mattress on this pile of rutabarkers, an old feather mattress. And I found no hot water bottle in it. And their hot water bottles, of course, are metal. They're aluminum. They can put hot water in it. And I felt that thing that was still warm. So I knew someone had been in that house not too long before we got there. So we checked it all out, tried to find people and couldn't find them. So we went ahead and went to bed, put a guard out. I went to bed. The next morning I jumped up real early and I killed three of these chickens. And I had a little French Canadian there named George Blaine. He's a pretty good cook. I told George, I said, George, you can cook these chickens, and that's what we're going to have for breakfast, for dinner today. We had jumped in there without, we didn't even have an overcoat or a bedroll or anything. You know, and we just jumped in there practically naked, and there's zero weather, snow, fanny deep to a tall end. Of, and uh, so, after a while, I heard this gibberish and gabbering going on, you know, and I walked in, and George is at the front door talking to two ladies and a boy, a kid about 14 years old. And I said, George, who are these women in this kid? What's the deal? He said, this is their house. I said, what do they want? He says, they want to take occupancy. I said, ask them where they were last night. So he talked to them a little bit. He said, they've got a neighbor up here that's got a real deep wine cellar, so they go up there and get out of the bomb and shell them. I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you tell them that uh, they may come in here and live with us and that they will not be molested. No soldier will take advantage of them. And I said, tell them the boy won't be bothered and we won't kill the boy. But I said, tell them that if they do come in here, that they must stay. They're not going to be let out here tonight either. You know, you couldn't tell. They may be in line with these crowds. I just tell them they're welcome to come in here, and but that they can't leave once they do take up residence here in their house. And I said, also tell them that I have three other chickens on the cook. A chicken is a very valuable piece of merchandise over there. I said, you tell them that I have three other chickens on cooking and they said, we'll share and share our life with us in the eating of these chickens. And tell them that we won't kill any more of their chickens that by evening I'll have food supplies that I'll scramble somewhere. And he said, oh, he said, you're really being nice to these people. So you're going to let them come in their house and you're going to be real good to them. And then said, they're your prisoners. They can't leave. And they said, you're not going to kill the kid. The women are not going to be molested, and they're going to get a part of their chip. He said, you're just being too good to them. He said, I can't tell him that. 
I said, George, if I could speak the language, I said, I wouldn't hesitate to tell them no. I said, if they come in here, they're not leaving and maybe going to the Germans and saying, they're in that house right there, just wipe it out. I said, this is a matter of protection. I said, uh, if they were coming in here with, with a house full of German soldiers, I said, they would be molested immediately. I said, someone would have them in a bed before they could get through the front room. And I said, if we were Germans, I said, we'd kill that kid. So he wouldn't be sharing any food in this nephew's book. I said, this is the way the Germans handle it. I said, I'm asking you to tell them this so they won't come in here and smell chicken cooking all morning and wonder if they're going to get any of it. I said, they're hungry just like you are. So I said, I, I wish you would tell them. And so he thought, oh, he said, okay, so I'll tell them. So he told them this. Well, before the day was over, I had butchered a hog. I found a big hog up in a, a park up down. I butchered that hog and skinned him out and just kicked the guts down the basement. And I wrapped that hog up in a sheet and I put the heart and the liver in a pillow slip separate, you know, and I'd found some potatoes and this and that. And that's what it was. And so we took off and went back down to the house. We had had, uh, hi, Mama. Hi. Mama, this is Todd. Uh, I had gone back at noon and ate lunch with these women and the guys that weren't fighting. And, and we had the chickens. And I had uh, George tell him, you know, we won't fool with the chickens anymore. And I had located this hog and I'd bring it in. So when I came in that evening, the first thing I smelled was chicken cooking. And I said, okay, okay. I said, who killed the chicken? And I said, nobody. And I said, look, I smell chicken cooking. And I said, he, they said, we're having chicken soup. I said, well, it takes chicken to have chicken soup. I said, who killed the chicken? I said, I told these gals we wouldn't kill any more than chicken. I said, y'all knew I had a hog spotted and I was going to butcher it this afternoon. And they said, they made soup out of the bones, out of the carcasses. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, they just said, we don't know what it's going to turn out like. They said, they've got bones that they busted up all in bones. And a little old hammer and they've got, they had a few potatoes and got some of those rutabarbers and found this and that. So we're having soup. And I said, well, I've got liver and heart here that we'll fry up and add to it. And so we got to cooking this stuff up. And that was the best chicken soup I ever tasted in my life. And my wife, we save our turkey carcasses every Christmas and every Thanksgiving. And she makes, we've got turkey soup out there right now in a deep freezer that, that you would, you've never tasted anything like it. But uh, every five years, I belong to the 101st Airborne Association, and uh, I've never taken the trip back over, but a lot of my friends have. One of the guys that was there, both two of the guys, George Blaine and Jack Agnew, have made trips back over there. And they went back and found this little old house. And they found a graveyard that we jumped by, and they went down and found this house. And those two women, five years ago, were still alive and living in the same house, and this little old boy that was 14 years old then, he is president of the bank at Bastogne. And they wouldn't let Jack and, and George or anyone else, you know, rent a motel. They got to live in their house when they're over there. They appreciated the way they were treated. You know. No, I've never taken a trip back over there. I have no desire. I enjoyed every second of it. I never had so much fun in any three and a half years of my life, any other segment, you know. Had a lot of hard times, a lot of bad times, but uh, it was uh, it was a great experience. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every minute of it. I had a lot of bad moments, just like everybody else did. That was over there. I would like to see this one thing recorded for sure and specific. Uh, there is a bad taste in everybody's mouth in the United States now, or Korea, Vietnam, and that sort of thing. I think that our attitude is, as citizens is, is terrible to all these guys deserting and leaving the country and refusing to fight and so forth and the atrocities that supposedly were committed in Vietnam and Korea and so forth. And all the time that I was in Europe and I was there the day before it started till, the, till several months after it ended, I never saw an American soldier commit an atrocity. I never 
saw an American soldier do anything that would have brought reproach upon this nation. The war was engaged in and fought successfully and, and handled in a proper manner. And I was proud to be an American. And I never ducked my head to anybody for what happened in that area. I'm sure, I'm sure that you can't draft five million boys and not have a few bad eggs in it. And I'm sure that a few atrocities were committed. But I mean, uh, it was exemplary conduct as far as I was concerned on the part of the American military service. And I do not believe in amnesty. If a guy deserts his country, if he refuses to fight for it, I think the government should offer him amnesty. And the minute his foot touches this soil, gun him down, kill him then in their own spot. That's my position. <laughs> okay. What I would like to do, thank you, let me shut that off. Those idiots gave an ultimatum, see, to, uh, Maxwell Taylor, uh, that was all unexpected. And that was one reason that I didn't take it into account when I volunteered for pathfinding service was that I had no idea that it would happen. No one else did. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Maxwell Taylor was back here in the United States. He was our division commander selling war bonds and making appearances and all this and that. So when we went into Bastogne, when the division went into Bastogne, General McCulloch was, uh, was the commanding officer. Well, they gave him this ultimatum. They gave him this ultimatum to surrender, or else they would annihilate it within thirty, within three hours. And what they were doing, what they were doing, they had seven divisions. There's a reproduction of it. They were, they were uh, attacked them with seven divisions an understrength I've airborne the divisions. Original. See, they had now, four infantry divisions. And these three are armies. some articles from newspapers and magazines yeah. at the time. So. Uh, when they gave him this ultimatum, of course, he just, uh, he didn't know what to do. He was just flabbergasted, and he said, on nuts. And this German says, what is that? Uh, I don't know what you're saying. How do you translate that? And this Colonel Johnson told McCullough, he said, that's good enough. He says, just tell him. That's not the Christmas says, card yet. He says, just write on that ultimatum, nuts. That's, that's what he... And says, let them figure it out later. And so he made the... Uh, let's see. He just wrote on there to them. He said, that is the, the answer. It's nuts. This he is said, a, this just a reproduced copy of that. 30 me, seconds to get out of here. And uh, so they uh, they took off. They took off. And then the next morning, they flew in a real low level, and they flooded the whole area with these uh, Christmas cards you I, I found a copy of it, yeah, but I haven't found a, the original that's in color. I've got one of the original. It's a beautiful thing. It's colored and everything. But they drop these things out by the hundreds of thousands. That is. Yeah, can't find, I, that's that a copy, but I can't find the original. They all. Ooh, if I've lost that original, I'll shoot myself. But anyway, they all. They oh, had daddy, on this daddy, thing, daddy, you know. Daddy. Daddy, I'm so afraid. And then down at the bottom, they said the mule tied and the mistletoe. Well, there it is right there. He's so got a forth. copy of it right in front of you and, uh, to surrender. And then they said, oh, goodwill on I've Earth. got it laminated. He's it's toward me and lies he on He got us. laminated. I've got the original laminated. And they said, peace on Earth, goodwill toward me and lies on the 300 yards to here. Trying to get oh, did he? Did he? The envelope, is it? Maybe. To individually surrender. No, that's something somebody else did. Oh, shucks. I know I've got it. I don't think I've let anybody get hold of that. Let uh, me see this picture here. Is that Pete Nuts? Let me tell you a funny thing about it. See that how little that little kid is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> his name was his name was John Hale. We call him Pete Nuts. He's a little bitty fellow. He wore a size four and a half boot. And uh, I was Let's laughing. See, okay. I came in here one day. I've got some of that stuff in not long ago. Another place. I came in here not long ago one evening, and I all uh, 
I had though. I was taking my boots off in there. Oh, during the ice and snow this my winter. My feet were just red as bleach, you know. It felt like icicles. And Martha, Martha said, what's the matter? And I said, oh, I said, honey, I said, my feet, you know, were frostbitten. And I said, they never heal up. I said, they give me a terrible time. Now, this was in the Stars and Stripes at the time. Terrible time when done. I, all when I get cold. So she rubbed some liniment and stuff on them. And Lotion. Lotion. And Let me see if I can find another photo. I said, when I, I jumped in the Bastogne, I, I said, when I jumped in the Bastogne, I said, the weather was down to zero, and I said, snow was, was hip deep to a tall end, and I said, oh, we didn't even have, I just jumped in and it just come back uniform. Mm -hmm. And I said, we didn't even have a bedroll or a blanket or an overcoat. And I said, the boot that I had on this left foot had a hole in the sole of it that big. She said, well, why did you jump in with in that kind of a boot? And I said, that's all I had. I said, when we made the invasion of Normandy, I said, they issued every one of us a pair of, a brand new pair of boots. And I said, that was the last issue we got. Mm -hmm. And I laughed and I told her about this little kid here named Pete Nuts Hale. Mm -hmm. He had all. He wore four and a half size boot, and then there was a boy over in communication section. He was long, tall. Oh boy, his foot was about that wide, and it was that long. He wore a 13. He wore a 13 triple A. Is A the small? A is small. He wore. He wore a triple A size 13. So each one of these guys and the quartermaster, they will not issue one boot of an odd size like that. They issue six pair at a time. So Pete Nuts got six pair of four and a half size boots that before we jumped in. And this other one, I forget what his name was, he got six pair because he wore 13 and a half triplet and both of them was killed that night. Neither one of them saw the sun come up. There they had six pair of good boots. And I wore one pair of boots all through that war. You mentioned about, did you have coffee in your boots? Oh, yeah, yeah. Powdered coffee. Powdered coffee. Yeah. The little, little packets pack of powder. No, that's all right. I thought maybe you might want to get a picture of that. That's the reason yeah. I was trying to move yeah. this. Okay. I was trying to get this out of your way. I thought maybe you might accidentally want to get a picture of that since um, front and back. You have a photograph of yourself in uniform during the war. Uh, yeah, I've got one around here somewhere. I can find it. I think I can. Can I take a copy of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's front and back of it. I may have a better copy of it than that. And this is a copy of the actual order that uh, McAuliffe yeah. issued there. There's the yeah. photo stat. I thought maybe you might want. That's a copy somebody sent us from um, it. Mounted. And we, well, we have a picture of Bremen. Yeah, I think I do. No, I think I gave the one of Raymond and you to Zoma. You might have. Or to Sydney to make up the. But I think I have one. I know I have one of you. Yeah, I think I have one of you. Yeah, I think I have one of you. Yeah, I think I have one of you. Could you hold that right there? But they went through a lot of trouble when they didn't get, they didn't have a man surrender, not an individual. Mm -hmm. um, now, where'd you have the coffee in your boots? Well, you, this is, a, this is an original jump boot, They're almost like the original yeah. jump boot, see? And uh, we always, uh, we always uh, tucked our pants down in here, see, you know, we just pulled them over like this and tuck them down in there or else we would take a, uh, a real heavy, we usually used uh, prophylactic kits. We'd take the rubbers out of them time together and make a band here and tuck her pants up under. But we would put her coffee, they were flat, you know, little flat packets like uh, 
this Sucre Street or whatever it is, and we would punch several of them down in there. That way they would keep them pretty dry, and you usually could reach your foot, you know. Even if you were badly wounded, you could usually reach your foot or something. And we carried, we'd just have the tops of those boots lined with those packets. They would drop all equipment bottles in all over the area that we would jump in. And you could tell what was in an equipment bottle by the color of the canopy. A uh, white canopy with a red cross on it was medical supplies. A blue canopy carried you 30 caliber ammunition. You green ones carried all, you green canopies always had your mortar ammunition. It, it, the color designated what was in a bottle. And when we would see a, a food bottle, when we'd see a bottle of food, well, there'd be bottles about, oh, I'd say 18 inches in diameter, and they'd be five or six feet long, and they had buckles on them. And we'd just run up and kick them buckles off. <coughs> and we would cut open all these packages, and we would get the coffee out of it, and the chocolate bars, and the cigarettes, and we'd throw all the food away. We'd save the cheese. The cheese was pretty good, but the rest of it wasn't fit to eat. And you didn't have room to carry a bunch of that stuff anyway. But the coffee was in just those little packets, like you, like you have these artificial sweeteners in there. Yeah. And you could carry 15 or 20 of those in your boot at a time. So that's where most of us carried our coffee. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I think I'm going to cut this off right now, and I'll come back in a couple of weeks, and I'll send you a list of questions and all that. Yeah, you know, questions that you intend to pose, and maybe I can go ahead and be thinking in my And also, anything else that you want to get on tape, too, that yeah. you can think of. The one thing I wanted to get on was that I thought that, that it's a shame at the attitude of people nowadays on, uh, on patriotism to their country. I don't. I never looked at and said a person who uh, who wasn't physically and mentally geared to go into combat. That's that's one thing. Some people aren't geared for it, and that's all right. And I don't object to that sort of thing. But there isn't any person in this country that can't contribute something physically to a war effort. If you don't have guts enough to, or you're not psychologically set up to engage in physical combat and take the lives of other people, why then you can drive a truck or you can work in a quartermaster corps or you can cook or you can carry bedpans in a hospital. So I find no room for a person to uh, deny service to his Take all you want to. Every guy took six with him. But you could have gone in and got your helmet full if you wanted to, you know. And then all the time that I was in there, I never saw but one man get on morphine. I didn't even see anyone experiment with it. We drank everything else, you know, that we could get our hands on and get drunk. But nobody was on dope. And so I talked, uh, they asked me to come out here to high school about a year and a half ago and hold a teacher's workshop. And I went out and talked, and I just briefly took them through airborne operations and, and the 101st Airborne Unit and all. And when I got through, I told them the same thing that I closed this out with, you know, my attitude on amnesty and on the cop-outs that I had seen. And I said, I know that we had a lot of men that served honorably in Vietnam. I said, I'm proud of them. I said, a lot of it was cop-out. I said, I said, those boys don't need to think that they've got a copyright on flashbacks. I said, I have flashbacks yet, still to this day, from World War II. But I said, it's something that I can live with. It's something that, that happens. And I said, I think it happens to everyone that was in hand-to-hand -hand combat over there. And I said, you're going to have flashbacks. You know, but I said, it's not a, uh -huh. they don't have That's a copyright true. on it. My grandfather had flashbacks in World War One. Sure, sure. Because he was over in France there in the trenches. And uh, I work at the Vietnam Vet Center in Oklahoma City. And I talk to some of these veterans. And I say, hey, if you, if you can't live with it, you better find a home to die. Yeah. Because I've noticed a lot of these Vietnam veterans that have 